in exploring what it takes to have a uniquely Christian expression of culture, one of the areas where the difference with the dominant culture will be the most glaring will be in the approach to the subject of divorce and remarriage. I believe that the dominant culture, not too many decades ago, had a view of divorce and remarriage that was probably not too far from that of what the Scripture teaches. And uh, in that respect, the dominant culture at one time was, not too, was fairly close to what I'm calling a radically Christian counterculture. But in our modern times, divorce has become very uh, easy. It is not stigmatized at all. Uh, it is uh, something that is considered to always be an available out if a marriage turns out to be unpleasant. And yet, this is very far from what the Bible teaches. There are very grave matters at stake when we consider the issue of divorce and remarriage, and the Bible speaks on the subject and gives, I believe, a distinctly Christian position about it, but that is not the position I feel that most Christians even have, and certainly the world does not share it. It's a very hard thing to steer the biblical course between an overly rigid, legalistic, harsh view of divorce and remarriage on the one hand, and uh, a, a greasy, uh, grace, uh, uh, libertarian kind of a view which uh, allows almost anything in people's lives uh, without criticism. And the fact of the matter is divorce in Scripture is wrong. Divorce is bad. At the same time, there are occasions when divorce is justified. Not that it is any less bad but that the badness or the guilt of it falls on one party and not on the other. And that the one who is not guilty, who but, but who finds himself or herself victimized in divorce, that person is not stigmatized scripturally and should not be punished or treated as a second-class Christian in the church. Now, you might think, because most of you here are young single adults, not yet married, that this subject could hardly interest you. For one thing, nobody who's single ever expects to be divorced. You're all quite sure that you will either not marry at all or else you'll marry the right person. And the right person will, of course, recognize that you are the right person for them and there will never be any stress on the marriage and never would divorce ever come up as an issue. But that is simply naive, I'm afraid, in many cases. It may not be entirely naive. I mean, if you are truly a spiritual person, you marry a truly spiritual person, then, of course, divorce as an issue will not arise in your marriage. The problem is sometimes spiritual people marry people that they think are spiritual, and one or both of them prove themselves not as spiritual as they appeared, and divorce occurs anyway. Divorces have occurred uh, in about 50% from what some statistics tell us of marriages in the United States. Not one of those marriages expected to end in divorce. And uh, so the odds are that without some strong incentives to break this trend, no marriage can be 100% sure of its security, of its safety. But there are incentives available to us to break this trend. Now the church, even if you never become a party to divorce, and I certainly hope that is the case, that you will not, yet you are going to be a part of the body of Christ. And in the body of Christ in the United States, you are going to encounter the, the issue of divorce. For one thing, there will be people in the church who either get divorced or are contemplating divorce or have already been divorced and are con contemplating remarriage or perhaps they've already been remarried. And the church either will turn a blind eye to this or else the church will take a position on it and hopefully enforce its position. But what is the position the church should take? The church has to really deal with this subject, and so does every individual, because every individual knows somebody who either is married contemplating divorce or is already divorced and contemplating remarriage or has already been divorced and remarried and wants to be in the church. And since the Bible clearly indicates that, at least in some cases, divorce and remarriage is a, the same thing as adultery, and that the Bible teaches that Christians should not associate with other Christians who are in the act of adultery. This is a very grave situation. 
On the one hand, I have known Christians who say, yes, all divorce and remarriage are adultery, but we will not disassociate or disfellowship people who are divorced and remarried. Well, this is not consistent. If you're going to say this is adultery, then let's be consistent. Let's have the courage of our convictions. If divorce and remarriage is always adultery, then the Christian who is divorced and remarried should be disfellowshipped. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5 and 9 that if anyone calls himself a Christian, but is an adulterer or fornicator, fornicator includes adultery, then that person, you shouldn't even eat with them, shouldn't have any company with them. And the church, as usual, has taken a flimsy, uh, namby-pamby approach to this subject, even, even where churches have taken a strong stance against divorce and are willing to decree some remarriages as adultery, very few churches are willing to disassociate from all divorced and remarried people. Now, I'm not saying they should, because my view is that divorce and remarriage is not always adultery. I believe that in many cases, perhaps even most cases, it is. But in some cases that the Bible strictly describes, it is not. And the way that the church treats the subject, and more particularly treats the people who are involved in divorce and remarriage, has got to be consistent with the teachings of Jesus himself. On the one hand, when you're dealing with a, a, a people who are in a second marriage, if their remarriage was in fact adultery, then it cannot be whitewashed. Those people need to be subjected to church discipline because they are in the church and they are committing adultery. On the other hand, if, they are not, if their remarriage is not adultery, then there's not one thing the church should hold against them at all. They may have had a failed marriage and they may be in a second or a third. But depending on the circumstances and the factors involved and, and how the Bible pronounces on those factors, the person may be as innocent as anybody in the church and should never be stigmatized as a divorced and remarried person. Either the person is guilty of grave sin or of no sin by being remarried. And the church should not have this third category of a gray area. They're not really guilty of gross sin, but they're not treated as if they're guilty of nothing either. They're treated as sort of a, uh, a leper of sorts or someone who's, you know, uh, they're not excluded quite as much as a leper is, but, uh, but they're not accepted with full confidence as members uh, without, without some kind of degree of stigmatizing. Now, let me start out by telling how much I believe God hates divorce and why. I personally hate divorce. You know that I have been divorced. Though I did not agree with the divorce, I did not, in, I did not initiate the divorce, I did not approve of the divorce, it happened to me. You also know that I have remarried. So obviously you, must, you either must assume that I don't live by my own principles or else my principles somehow allow for divorce and remarriage, at least in some cases, and that is the case. But I want to begin by saying I and all right-minded people hate divorce, and God himself says he hates divorce. Once I was being considered uh, for, uh, for eldership in a particular church, at w along with some other men, I actually ended up being an elder in that church, but some of the people in the church complained to the pastor that since some of these men being considered for eldership were divorced, although at the time I was not remarried, but I was divorced, that uh, they were concerned that an elder ought not to be a divorced person because they thought that in counseling marriages, an elder who had been divorced might go lightly on the subject of divorce, might lightly counsel divorce. It is evident that those who had this concern are not personally themselves divorced. Nobody who has ever been victimized by a divorce could ever conceivably take it lightly. It is the most excruciating, the most uh, uh, to be avoided at all costs experience that anyone could ever go through. And a person who has been the victim of a divorce would never lightly counsel someone to be divorced. In fact, in my experience, I have never counseled anyone to be divorced under any circumstances. I believe that although divorce is permissible under some circumstances, I do not believe that I would ever counsel anyone to be divorced, even if those circumstances which permitted it were present. I think divorce is that heinous. I believe divorce is that painful, that destructive, that I would not counsel divorce even if a person was in a very, very uh, painful marriage and one where they had grounds for divorce. Now what I would counsel and what I would allow are different things. 
But let me tell you why I'm so opposed to divorce. I think it's the same reasons that God is. There is much at stake in, whether, in, in the church's approach to the subject of divorce. If the church takes the wrong approach to the subject and treats divorced people in the wrong manner, there are several things that stand to be compromised. One is the purity and the testimony and the unity of the church. On the one hand, if the church takes a light view of divorce and makes no issue of it, then the purity and the testimony of the church is compromised. On the other hand, if the church takes a more firm than scriptural approach to divorce and remarriage, then the church's unity is going to be damaged because people whom God holds nothing against will, in some cases, the church will hold something against them. And there will be division in the church where God doesn't recognize division. That we may become guilty of calling that which God has cleansed unclean, which we're not permitted to do. Uh, also at stake is the sanctity of the divine institution of marriage. If we treat marriage as if it is like any other relationship that can be broken up whenever both parties just find it inconvenient, then we are degrading marriage. We're degrading its divine and sacred status. It's clear that when people are friends and they cease to be friends, they can part company and there's no, no wrong necessarily done in that. But that's because friendship is not a divine institution with the kinds of sanctions and controls upon it that exist on marriage. If we treat marriage as something that people can lightly walk away from, we degrade marriage and we bring it down to the level of other relationships, which it is not really a, a position, that's not the position it's supposed to occupy. It is a lofty and divine and sanctified relationship. Also at stake, of course, is the security of the children's right to be raised by both of their original parents. People who seek divorce often don't give enough consideration to this, but God does. God is very concerned about those who would stumble little children. Little children who might otherwise believe in Him are stumbled by the behavior of some adults. Divorce is one of those behaviors that greatly stumbles children. Children in God's sight, have the right to be raised by two parents. Now, God alone has the right to deprive them of this. If one parent dies, for example, that's God's business. But it is not our place to initiate the separation of parents so that the children are not given their basic right to be raised by two parents. That is at stake. If the church does not take the right stance on this, then children's rights in this matter will be uh, compromised. And finally, if the church doesn't take the proper stance on divorce, the very stability of society's most fundamental element, the family, will be threatened. Because the world is not out there to support the family. The church alone, well, and a few cults, are out there supporting the family. Secular society is willing to redefine the family any which way and to redefine marriage any which way. And a family is just any people who care strongly for each other. In the world's eyes, it can be, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, heterosexual. It doesn't have to be monogamous. It doesn't, there doesn't even have to be a marriage. And therefore, the only hope for the survival of the family, which is the essential building block of society, is that the church will take a biblical stand and stand by it. And when the church takes a non-biblical stand on divorce, then the church basically relinquishes its role as a conscience to society and as the salt of the earth, I believe. So this is what is at stake. It's not a small matter. Now, let me tell you what's wrong with divorce. First of all, divorce is wrong because it is the breaking of a vow that is made before God and witnesses. <coughs> there has never been a divorce yet where one or both parties did not become guilty of perjury. Perjury is lying under oath. When you get married, you take an oath. The oath, if you will recall, I'm sure you've been to enough weddings to know, the oath goes something like this. That I, in order to be married to this person, will forsake all others and cleave only to this person for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, for rich or for poor, until death do us part. That means there are no circumstances that under which I intend to, uh, to leave this marriage. And I'm making a vow to that effect before God and before witnesses. Now, if you swear in co a court of law to tell the truth and then you're found a lie, uh, you, you can be penalized severely for that because that's a crime. 
it's no less a crime, if anything, it's a much greater crime to lie to God or to lie about a sacred thing in the sight of God, like marriage. And everyone who divorces their spouse either is themselves perjuring themselves because they made an oath and now they're making a lie of their oath, or else they are doing so justifiably because their partner has perjured themselves and has, has uh, violated their oath. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, it is made clear that God does not take lightly oaths that are made before him. It says in Ecclesiastes 5, 4, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. It is better not to vow than to vow and not to pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Oh, I, I promised, but I didn't realize how hard it would be to keep this promise. The messenger of God, the minister, this is, Solomon's not talking only about marriage, he's talking about vows in general, but certainly this would apply to the uh, marriage vow. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the works of your hand? For in the multitude of dreams and many words there is also vanity, but fear God. This is certainly something that does not exist where divorce is taken lightly, the fear of God. People do not fear God. They make oaths before God and then they feel themselves free to break those oaths. There's no fear of God before their eyes. God has no pleasure in fools. It says it's better not to ever vow in the first place than to vow and break the vow. So uh, the unfaithfulness exhibited in, in uh, breaking a vow is a great offense to God, biblically. We know this is true. But divorce is wrong for other reasons, too, and that is because it makes victims out of someone, out of many people. If you divorce your spouse without grounds, then there are certain things that you have taken from them to a greater or lesser degree. One of them, depending on how long the marriage has lasted and whether they, you were their first spouse or whatever, uh, certainly in many cases, years of a person's youth have been stolen from them. Now, most people won't give away years of their life lightly. A woman gives a man years of her life on the promise that he will stay with her forever. If she had reason to believe he was going to break that promise, she probably wouldn't have given him any part of her life if she was wise. But by promising and by making a vow to stay for life, you encourage the other person to give themselves to you. And sometimes the very best years, their most, most youthful years, their years of opportunity are the ones they give you. And then you rip them off. That's theft of something that is irreplaceable. You can't give it back to them. You can't make restitution for this easily. You take away their innocence if, they were, if you were their first lover. And their privacy, you, you have seen them in intimate situations that they would not allow everyone to see them in. You've taken their privacy, but you've not kept it safe. You take their virginity, if indeed they were a virgin at the time. You take from them forfeited options for personal happiness. That is to say, if they hadn't married you, the unfaithful, they might have married someone who would have been faithful. They might have had opportunity to marry happily had they not believed you when you said you would be faithful. And this is why it is so grievous, because it rips people off. It is a, a cheating and a stealing of something. It, it steals from the spouse the natural deep-seated human hope of sharing life and children with one lifelong partner. This is a basic instinct that everyone has, except those who just don't have any attraction to marriage at all. People who, go, who move in the direction of marriage do so because they hope to have a lifetime relationship with one person and to raise children and have a family with that person. This is the thing that I found most galling when my wife, my first wife, divorced me. Is that I, as a Christian minister at the time, and still now, it was very important to me from my childhood that when I marry and raise a family, that my family be a model of, of Christian family and that my children could be raised in a, in a godly home as I was. And when my wife just took it lightly, went out and had affairs, eventually just ran off and divorced me, I realized she couldn't possibly understand the degree to which she was ripping me off of th something I'd only have one chance in a lifetime to have, and that is a lifetime partner. My daughter was ripped off by this as well, because she, she was one year old when my wife ran off, 
And since then, she was passed back and forth between me and my ex-wife, and my daughter was not given what a child should be given. I'm not bitter toward my ex-wife. I must confess I had trouble with that initially. I'm not bitter now, but I will not mince words. She is a criminal against God. She's a criminal against me. She's a criminal against her daughter, and she has no repentance. And this is not a light matter with God. There's another set of victims, too, in a divorce, and that is that it causes incalculable emotional pain and financial hardship upon the cheated spouse, especially in the case of the cheated spouse happens to be the man, and he has to pay child support, and yet he doesn't have the pleasure of raising his children. This is cheating, big time. This is criminal. And a woman leaves her faithful husband, takes the children, requires him to pay for their support, and yet deprives him of what, he, of what she promised him, namely that she would stay with him and raise the children together. This is an abomination. It is injustice at a very high degree. It also creates a great deal of emotional pain on the children of the family and concerned relatives and sympathetic friends. I grieve whenever I hear of a friend whose marriage fails. I feel tremendous ache inside of me for it. Now, I, I'm not even involved, except emotionally. But any time of marriage fails, those who love both parties, especially those who love the cheated party, or who love the children, let's say the grandparents are involved or whatever, uh, and, and they love their grandchildren, there, there's tremendous pain caused by this, as well as, in many cases, financial hardship, because it costs more to maintain two households than to maintain one. And the person who breaks up the household and, and expects the breadwinner to support both of them is, uh, to my mind, extremely unjust. And, uh, and it is criminal. It is criminal. We should never, in any sense, whitewash this or make it sound like it's, not, it's only a little bit bad or not bad at all. It is, it is uh, criminal at a high degree. Now, having said all these things negative about divorce, And therefore, they don't need to mention that exception, which would never come up, hopefully, among Christians. But Matthew, giving more detail about what Jesus actually said, said there was an exception. Now, there's really much more that deserves to be said about this. I'm going to have to make a decision between now and our next lecture whether I want to go another lecture or just leave it at this simple summary. I have a feeling the subject is important enough to get more uh, down to details about it. But in a nutshell, we can say this, the teaching of the Old and New Testament is marriage is a covenantal relationship and the only thing that can really break that covenant is adultery. And when one par party does commit adultery, the cheated party has the option of forgiving and continuing the relationship or saying, well, that's it, and saying the covenant is broken, I'm out. And uh, God did this himself. And once he did so, he took another people, made a new covenant with a new people. And God is the model for behavior for us. If a Christian is divorced on grounds of adultery, then that person has the option of remarriage, just like God did. But perhaps we'll have more to say about this. Unfortunately, we won't have anything more to say about it in this session because, sadly, we've run out of time.